Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the book of Genesis, a line-by-line study of the first book of the Sacred Scriptures. Hello friends and welcome back. We're in chapter 40 and 41 of Genesis. We're with Joseph. He's been thrown in jail. What God has done for Joseph, all these amazing things that he's done, speaking through him and working through him and filling him, God wants to do again with each and every one of us in each of our lives. We just have to say yes and stop swimming against the stream of what God wants to do. That's what so often we do. That's what we do when we sin. Amen. He wants us to go with his flow, to swim along the stream. And we see that Joseph is doing this even in prison. So Joseph meets a butler and a baker. Um, And it appears to be that Joseph is still serving. Notice this. He's still in a servant mode. Somehow he's... um, tasked to take care of them and make sure that they have the things they need. This does not look like it's a really high security dungeon with chains and darkness, right? This, this is probably a pretty plush place for, um, you know, like it's like the white collar crime sort of prison. But these two guys have been personally in Pharaoh's company for, for, for years probably, on a daily basis, they would have been in his inner circle. So why were they in prison? Well, we can only speculate. We're not told. Maybe because there was a a plot to murder Pharaoh. There was some kind of poisoning going on because it was the the butler, who's also called the cup bearer, and the baker. Hmm. That should ring a bell right off the bat. There's a cup bearer and a baker, a baker of bread. So there's there's going to be lots of links, lots of little alarm bells that are going to go off that will remind us of Jesus through this whole session. So they come to Jesus, or, or, or rather they come to, to prison with Joseph. Joseph sees that they're downcast, which is really kind of interesting. This is a window into Joseph's heart. He has every reason to be bitter. He's betrayed by his brothers and thrown in a pit. He's betrayed by Mr. Potiphar and Mrs. Potiphar and thrown in a prison. And if this were me, I would tend to just draw into myself and wallow in self-pity, but not Joseph. Joseph tenderly asks them, why are they downcast? What's wrong? He says, tell me your dreams. Tell them to me, I beg you. Isn't that a great conversation starter? And then he says, the interpretations of the dreams belong to God. Super important to catch. Joseph realizes that this is a partnership between himself and God. He realizes there's a partnership going on here. Now, when when these two gentlemen share their dreams, this is the second of three sets of two dreams. Joseph had two dreams when he was a teenager. There are two dreams here in prison. And Pharaoh, in the next chapter, is going to have two dreams. And each time, these three sets of dreams, they come in pairs and they're very similar. So one of the reasons they come in pairs is to demonstrate that they're serious, that they're from God, that they're legitimate. I mean, there's a possibility of an idle dream anytime. I mean, we all dream crazy things sometimes. But having the same dream twice, it shows us there's something going on. There's a little bit of accuracy here. Plus, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 19, we're told that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter may be established. These two dreams are acting like two witnesses in the Bible. That's very interesting. And, and and there are three sets of these dreams, and three is always Bible code that it's a sign that God is somehow involved. Even, even the Jewish rabbis, even the, the commentaries from Judaism talk about 
The number three is an involvement in God, even though they don't necessarily believe in the Trinity the way we do, they do see that there's something about the three, the tribe, that really points to the working of God. So God does still speak to us in dreams. He spoke to people in dreams way back then. And what I want you to notice here is that God gives revelations to the Egyptians, to foreigners who are not part of the family of Israel. No doubt they worshiped Egyptian gods like Amun-Ra, right? And yet God is revealing himself to people who don't know him, right? And when they have this dream, they don't know what to make of this revelation. I think we probably miss many of the times when God is speaking to us. We probably miss the way God is working all around us all the time, even amongst people who are not believers. The word dream shows up in the Bible about 125 times. Of these, 42 times are in the book of Genesis alone. 35 times out of 125 are all in the story of Joseph. This is a major theme of this book. And throughout the Bible, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, many of the prophets have amazing supernatural visionary dreams. In the New Testament, God spoke to Joseph four times in dreams, the, the New Testament Joseph. The Magi were warned in a dream not to go back to report to Herod. Over and over again, dreams. St. John's entire book of Revelation is a, is a big giant dream. Saints also have received messages in dreams. St. Patrick was guided in a dream and how to escape his captivity. And then later in another dream, he was instructed to go back to Ireland. St. John Bosco, St. John Bosco, he, he dreamed so often that there's a book called The 40 Dreams of St. John Bosco, right? And I mean, dreams are still active today. You want to hear some really good news? God is speaking to lots of people who are not listening to him. At least they're not intentionally listening to him. Over the last 40 years or so, especially in the last 25 years, there's been a massive occurrence of Muslims who have been converting to Christianity many times due to dreams. And due to dreams that sometimes include not only Jesus, but also Mary. About 10 years ago, a Christian writer named David Garrison published a book where he did a massive amount of research on this topic. It is utterly astounding. And there's a documentary called Sheep Among Wolves about the exploding underground Christian church in Iran. In Iran, official reports are saying that Iran is closing their mosques by the thousands. There are so many people coming to faith in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? In fact, in uh, I think it was about 15 years ago, uh, 15 years ago or so in Gaza, there was a story that hit the news that over 200 Muslims embraced Jesus after they discovered 200 different people had the exact same dream about Jesus. Now, what's happening with this, the common thread, is that the dreams by themselves do not immediately result in conversion, but they open the door. They start the quest of seeking. And after receiving the dreams, these Muslims are often led to other believers who enter into a relationship with them and explain the gospel and lead them to Christ. So anyway, that's very exciting. Dreams are still ongoing. So back in this chapter, the butler, the, the cupbearer, explains his dream, and he's going to hand the cup back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is going to raise his head to freedom again. And, and Joseph is very bold here. He, in this dream, there are, there are three, three vines, three, you know, three of these, of these vine shoots. And he says, in, in three days, everyone is going to know that this is correct or not, because this is going to happen in three days. 
I mean, Joseph's bold by giving a timeline for this dream. And then Joseph says in verse 14 and 15, so, hey, buddy, remember me when you get out to Pharaoh because I'm the dream reader and I'm here because of a big mess and a mistake and I really want out of here. This is the only time in this entire book and this entire story of Joseph that he even like slightly sounds like he's complaining a bit. And this is not a complaint. So the baker hears this and he says, oh, good. My dream was very similar. Me too. Like, like give me a, a, a dream interpretation like that. Well, it sounds very similar on the surface, but basically what Joseph says is you'll be raising your head too, but you won't be raising your head to look at Pharaoh. Uh, in three days, your head will be lifted off from your body. The Egyptians didn't hang their criminals. They beheaded their criminals, and then they stuck their bodies on a large stake, on a wooden stake, hanging their body from a tree. How many of us would be willing to preach to the cupbearer, but not so happy about preaching the bad news to the baker, right? We usually love to give good news. Joseph is honest enough to give both. And in the days to come, it all happened exactly as Joseph said. Yet, after all that, the chief butler did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So Joseph is wronged again. Wow. So at the end of this chapter, I just I want you to look at all the rich Jesus imagery in the scene. Secular rulers are ruling against the chosen one of God. There's dreams, like Pilate's wife has a dream, right? There's wine, there's bread, there's three days, there's death, there's hanging on a tree, two prisoners, one is freed. The other one is condemned. There are so many beautiful connections between Joseph and Jesus. Again, just to underscore, just to point again, how, how Joseph is a type of Christ. Jesus is like all over the pages of the Old Testament. Then to chapter 41, we have two years go by. Jojo is in prison. It's a very long time. And now Pharaoh has a dream. In his dream, um, there's seven really fat cows, and then there's seven really thin, ugly, gaunt cows, and the thin, ugly cows eat the fat cows, but they don't get any fatter. They stay gaunt and thin. Now, Pharaoh also has another dream, but this time it's about corn. It's almost the exact same thing. It's very, very similar, but... In his spirit, Pharaoh just must have known there's something important about this. And he maybe he was talking with Mrs. Pharaoh. Maybe he was talking with his chief advisors. And the cupbearer, who had just been freed, overheard it. And, and he said, oh yeah, actually he had just been freed, what, two years ago? And the cupbearer says, oh, that reminds me, there's a guy in prison that can read your dream. Because Pharaoh, even his magi, even his great uh, advisors couldn't read the dream. So here's where it starts to get interesting. Um, Joseph is shaved, given a change of clothes, and brought before Pharaoh. What this is about, just, just a little quick thing, is that Egyptian men usually had clean shaven faces. Or maybe just a little goatee. We see that in, in the art of, of Egypt. Um, unlike other ancient peoples who mostly had beards, and in fact, Egyptians often shaved their head. They were, they were completely bald. <clears throat> Some of us can relate to that. And so here's where I think Joseph's character shines the most. Think of the power that he is placed in here. Think of the opportunity that's given to him. Pharaoh is the richest, most powerful man on the face of the earth, and Joseph could have abused this power for anything. He could have taken anything he wanted. He could have twisted this to his advantage. But he didn't do that. He merely told Pharaoh the dream. There'll be seven years of plenty and seven years of abundance. Right? And 
that's going to be followed by seven years of want, seven years of famine. Okay, so I said that a little screwy, but seven good years and seven bad years, right, all together. So what Joseph does is he, he sees what the dreams are pointing to. He's interpreting the dreams, but then the whole thing shifts a bit because to this point, Joseph has just been displaying knowledge, words of knowledge given by God, like we might call it prophecy, right? But now Joseph began to apply wisdom to the knowledge. Knowledge tells you what's going on. Wisdom tells you what to do about it. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is using information for transformation. Knowledge can be a charism from God, a gift that's given to us so that we can teach other people. But wisdom is a, char is a charism from God, a gift given to us so that we can fix situations and circumstances and help other people. Joseph was not only an interpreter, but now he becomes a wise civil engineer, a government manager. Like he has to know about accounting and farming and everything in between. And what he does is he proposes a way to fix the situation, or at least to get through the situation. Steve Ray points out in his book that this is a massive government project. I mean, I just want you to think of the infrastructure here. We think in Egypt at this time, there were maybe 2 million people in, in their land and in the outlying lands. Laws had to be passed. Officials had to be hired. Think of all the wagons and carts and storehouses that had to be built. Skilled workers at every point all around the nation. Smooth roads for transport, tax collectors and record keeper and keepers and, and people that were dispute managers, right? Such an inter enterprise covered 14 years, tens of thousands of square miles, and millions of tons of grain. This was a remarkable achievement. And Joseph was the man. So Pharaoh imposes basically a 20% tax. That's like a fifth of all the grain. Normally it was a 10% tax. But there's no record of the people grumbling or being alarmed or upset by this. It sounds like they explained what was happening, right? And if the crops were so abundant for seven years, so what if they gave away 20%? They may have still had lots more. But during this time, this is really important, God tells Joseph in this that he he's giving them he's giving Joseph this image so that the land may not perish during the famine. This is an urgent call to action. Now here's a little theological road trip once again. God could have saved all this trouble and simply snapped his fingers and made it rain. Right? Couldn't he have done that? Couldn't he have just miraculously had the crops grow any way that he wanted to like he could have performed a, an amazing miracle but like so many instances this is a time when god does not enact a miracle why because he wants to do this work through a man and through people a nation in fact let's go all the way back to the beginning to the root of all this could God have just defeated Satan right in the Garden of Eden, right in chapter 3, just stomped on Satan's head and ended the whole thing and just um, forgiven Adam and Eve and it would have just been over? Could he have done that? Of course he could have. He could have defeated Satan then. And he did defeat Satan on the cross. He did defeat Satan in a way that Sin is no longer controlling us, but God doesn't wipe away Satan yet. There still is this lingering death, this lingering sin, even though the war is won. Why doesn't God just wipe Satan away? Why doesn't God just snap his fingers and make this end? Because he wants us to cooperate. Satan is so strong and so evil and so prideful and so vain, 
isn't it a greater victory and more humiliating for him if he's crushed by a little girl from Nazareth and her apple-eating humans, right? Her, her family of apple eaters. God allows us the good pleasure of us participating in the defeat of Satan. We defeat Satan in our own lives through the power of God. It's all through the power of Jesus. It's through the power of the cross, through the doors of heaven being open. God has ultimately cornered Satan. He's won the war, but there are still skirmishes for our soul going on. There's still battles for our soul until the very end. As Father John Ricardo says, there are still some cleanup battles, right? There's some resettling of territory where God has left it to us. And God has given us the authority to say no to Satan and to defeat him. But we have to choose it. We have to participate. And Joseph is given all the authority of God, even before the cross, right? He's given all the authority of God to do something amazing here. But he has to cooperate, and he does. So back to the original thought, why did God not just make the drought go away? He wanted to give Joseph and even Pharaoh and all the people of Egypt a chance to participate with him in making it through this famine. Joseph is showing us how to live under the power and authority of God as a body of people cooperating. The whole nation of Egypt is coming together. And remember, they're pagans, right? They're worshiping false gods, and they're coming together through this man of Yahweh. And it says in verse 37 and 38 that Pharaoh perceives a presence of God's spirit in Joseph. This is a man in whom is the spirit of God. Now, Pharaoh had plenty of priests and magicians and holy men, but what he did not have until Joseph was a man with the spirit of Yahweh, of Elohim, of God. This is the first mention in the Bible of the Holy Spirit living inside someone. I, I mean, back in Genesis 2, it does tell us that God breathed the breath, right? The Ruach into Adam and Eve. But this is the first time that we read about someone being filled with that spirit, that the Holy Spirit is in him in a unique way. The breath of God, the Ruach Elohim, right? The Ruach Elohim. God is in him. The spirit of God is in him. And this is some, you know, 18 or 1900 years before Jesus. Up till now, Jacob's uh, Jacob, who is Joseph's dad, right? He was the one at Bethel, right? He's the one who had the vision of the staircase to heaven. But Jacob has not seemed to allow that reality to transform him yet. But Joseph does right off the bat. Somehow he's so attuned to God and loves him and trusts him. He acts in a way that we've not seen by anyone else so far in Genesis. Maybe our friend Enoch who walked with God and was no more, but he was only given a couple sentences. Like, like sacred scripture gives us a dozen chapters or more with Joseph, right? So I, I want you to see something about Bethel and the stairway to heaven. And when Jacob was there, what do we call a place where heaven and earth meet? Where it's a meeting place of God and angels and man, a holy place. We might call that place a temple. A temple in the ancient world is where two worlds overlap. The realm of heaven overlaps with the realm of earth. The temple is like a stairway between the two worlds or a gateway or a doorway. <laughs> For us Catholics, the church building acts like that. The altar acts like that. All of the sacraments act like that. Like In a sense, the sacraments are doorways to heaven. Right? We have access to both worlds. And there's another temple that Jesus referred to himself. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And then there's another temple that St. Paul refers to, us. 
Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God's Spirit dwells within you? If the, the temple is a meeting place between heaven and earth, that's the place where God is worshipped. That's the place where the Spirit dwells. St. Paul is saying, you are that place. God could choose to live anywhere he wants, and he chooses us to be his temple. This is utterly amazing. And, I, and I'm saying all this to bring it back to Jojo here, right? To bring it back to Joseph. He's the first person detailed in scripture who accepts this and lives with the spirit of God within him. Egyptians all around him are drawn to him. They see something in him they've never seen before. I would argue that, that back in the last uh, episode, we talked about how beautiful, how handsome, how good looking Joseph was. I would say that it's probably not just physical beauty. There's something about him that is so attractive to other people. They see God within him. They see he is a temple of the living Elohim, right? And they come to see the God of Israel. Brothers and sisters, we're all called to be that kind of temple. Some of you are already living like that. I know you are. But some of you, and sometimes we'll encounter someone and we're like, oh man, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that. This is the call for every single Christian. We are all called to be a temple like that. A temple like Joseph. So Joseph so impresses Pharaoh, he gets promoted. And Joseph is given second in command in the Egyptian empire. This is utterly astounding, right? Uh, the sign of this high status, he's given a signet ring, gold coin, cords, chains, fine linen, a new name, all sorts of authority, a chariot, and a wife. By the way, this is the first time the word chariot appears in the Bible. And, 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 and Joseph, it's so awesome. It's so awesome because what, what Pharaoh is giving Joseph is basically everything except his throne. Right? And we know this is true. We know that there were these things, these signet rings and cords and, and fine linen, because the Egyptian museums have these spectacular items on display, and we can see them. And there are all kinds of records of this being handed to Pharaoh's second in command. So this is not the only time this happens. And also, does this remind you of something with our Lord and Peter, the prime minister of the kingdom? Peter isn't given a signet ring. St. Peter is given the keys of the kingdom. But the signet ring that Pharaoh has literally has the power to shut and open, to bind and loose. Isn't that interesting? So you have the second in command, given all authority. Isn't it interesting, too, that the special robe that started this whole mess, that, that got Joseph in so much trouble with his brothers back home, now... He's clothed with a royal robe of fine linen, linen that's given by a king. The first robe signified greatness, and the second robe gives off authority of greatness. And Pharaoh gave Joseph a new name, just like Peter was given a new name. It's now Zaphnath Paeniah, something like that. Um, there's a lot of debate about what that means. Some think it means God speaks and he lives. Some think that it's an actually an acrostic of a whole bunch of different words. And when you string it together, it kind of spells that. Whatever it means, it's not as clear as when it's a Hebrew name, because we know a lot of the Hebrew language, we can kind of parse it out. Egyptian words are very different. So we're not sure exactly what it means, but it's something like God speaks and he lives. And God also, I mean, rather Pharaoh, Pharaoh also gave him a wife, Azanath. 
Azanath is the daughter of Potaphera, priest of An. Huh, Potaphera. Does that sound familiar at all? Jewish legends say that Azanath was actually the daughter of Dinah and Shechem. Remember, Dinah was the sister of Joseph, the one that was um, attacked in, in the city of Shechem. And that legend is that she and Shechem had, a, had a, a baby, but the baby, the daughter, was abandoned on the border of Egypt. And a family of an Egyptian priest named Potaphera, huh, interesting name, they adopted this baby. Now, I, that doesn't necessarily fit. It doesn't have to be. I'm just saying that's a legend. But I want you to look at that name, Potaphera. Doesn't that sound a lot like Potiphar? There are a handful of scholars that think Potiphar was actually a priest in Egypt and that this um, Azanath, right, this Azanath, she is the daughter of Potiphar. And that maybe this Poti Potifera is really uh, like his priestly name. Um, in which case, Joseph married Potiphar's daughter. Uh, his wife, Mrs. Potiphar, was probably not very happy about that if, if that were the case. But here's an interesting little historical thing. Azanath is from Hylopolis, the city of the sun. It's about seven miles from modern-day Cairo. In Hylopolis at this time, there was an immense pinkish granite obelisk, a tall pointed column structure like the Washington Monument. It was over 80 feet tall. It weighed tons and tons. It was believed to be dedicated to the sun god. They think the obelisk was built by a pharaoh in around 1835 to 1875 BC. So this column could have possibly been there and seen by Abraham when Abraham went to Egypt with Sarah when they were avoiding the famine back in their day that this column would have been seen here with Joseph. This column would have been seen later by Moses when he was in Egypt. And the story goes, this column was seen by Jesus when Jesus and his family traveled to Egypt. Today, this obelisk stands in the center of St. Peter's Square in Vatican City. This is the obelisk that was moved to Rome around 37 AD by the Emperor Caligula. And it was erected in Nero's Circus, that, that area where the races and the games and the brutal murder of enemies in Rome took place, right, with thousands of spectators. And it was there that St. Paul and St. Peter were martyred. So it looks like Caligula, Emperor Caligula, moved that giant granite huge stone in an amazing, amazing feat of engineering, moving it from Egypt to Italy. I can't even imagine how they possibly did this. And they moved it there. And then at one point, it was moved just a few hundred yards, as I understand it, to the present place where it is today. Here, this obelisk was a silent witness to the travels of all these Old Testament folks, to the travels of Jesus, it is a silent witness to the martyrdom of Peter and Paul and hundreds of Christians thrown to the lions and executed by Rome. Imagine if this obelisk had a video camera attached to it. Imagine what you would have seen through the story of salvation. Isn't that just amazing? Well, during this time, while the, the nation was in the time of, of great fruitfulness, Joseph has two sons. Manasseh, which means to forget, may, may uh, God help me to forget my toil. May, God, may I forget my past in my father's house, Manasseh. The other son's name is Ephraim for fruitful. For God has let me be fruitful in this land of my affliction. Manasseh, forget. Ephraim, fruitful. 
And the famine was exactly as Joseph had described from his dreams, right? And where we pick up next time, there's a nomadic shepherd group. There's a family that's tending flocks way over in Canaan. They have no warning that this famine is coming. And they're on the verge of starvation. And they're going to decide to travel to Egypt as a last resort. And that's where we pick up next time in chapter 42. Oh, it is this fun. Thanks for joining me, everyone. Thank you so much for walking with us through this study of the book of Genesis.